afternoon. I'm Ralph Johnson. I'm one of the authors of Design Patterns. Uh, there were uh, four of us who wrote it, so I'm only one of, uh, of the group. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, you know, sort of what's happened since, what we've, we've learned from uh, teaching um, design patterns, from people using them, watching people use them. Design patterns uh, actually came out in 94, but if you look at any copy of it, it will say copyright 95. I, I learned that's one of the things. Sometimes they publish books a little bit sooner than they say to make it look like they're newer because most technical books only, um, only sell for a couple of years, so they're trying to make it look uh, newer. But in fact, our book is still selling, so uh, it, it's uh, a, a counterexample of that general rule. Uh, we uh, we worked on it for several years. We had uh, not a website because we wrote it before the web started. So it was um, it was a FTP site, and we had mail list that you could use to talk about it. You could download FTP uh, postscript files. Um, PDF hadn't been invented yet, uh, and you could uh, and, and we had people reading it. About 500 people on our mailing list, so we had a lot of discussion about it. And consequently, when the book finally came out. There were you know, a lot of people who had read drafts of it, and, and there was a lot of, of hype about the book. And so it sold really well from the start. And in the years since then, it's won lots of different awards. The last one, I think, was uh, 2010. Um, and it's had a big influence. Now, my uh, the thing I'm happiest about is that it's encouraged other people to write books. Because the four of us were not you know, the end all and be all of, of thinking about software. So uh, other people were encouraged to write books. In the, in the beginning, um, their, the books were uh, very similar. I mean, they were talking about the same patterns. So uh, the first one that was written that was on design patterns, the same patterns we wrote about, was the Design Pattern Small Talk Companion. We thought there'd probably be a lot of different books, people applying these ideas in different languages and showing how it would be done. Design Patterns is written mostly with C++, a little bit of small talk, but mostly C++. Uh, one of the, the, this Heads First Design Patterns is one of the best of the books that's you know, take off on design patterns. How many people have read Heads First Design Patterns? It's really a great book, and it's the first one that got to the point where it actually sells more in a given year, sells more copies than, than design patterns. It's more of a tutorial and uh, is, is an excellent book. has a lot of good ideas in there that if we ever get around to writing a second edition, um, I'm going to you know, borrow ideas from, from that book. Um, but also, what's really great is all the books on completely different kinds of patterns, not design patterns. They're, they're different kind of patterns. And so one of my favorite is Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design. How many people have read that book? Good. It's, it's a very uh, good and important book, and not as much about object-oriented programming as you might think when you, you read. I mean, there, there are sections of it that are very much about object-oriented programming, but in fact, uh, most of the book is applicable to all sorts of stuff. I had a student in a class where we were using it who was uh, embedded real-time programming in C and said, oh, you know, all the stuff in the book is just so applicable to what we do. Uh, Martin Fowler has written Patterns books, several of them actually. Uh, the one that's sold the most, I think, is the Patterns of Enterprise um, Application Architecture. Uh, there's a, uh, the Hillside Group uh, promotes work on patterns, uh, has conferences about writing patterns, and um, has a, a website where they keep lots of inf information so you can see. It's not all the books that have been written on patterns, but they have, they have a lot of books on their uh, site. Now, the design patterns itself was a catalog of patterns. And so Eric Gama was the one who came up with the idea of doing it. And uh, the other two were actually working with him. And he came and invited me to do it. And it was like, I've never written a catalog before. So this would sort of be interesting to, to write a catalog. And, and we went into it not thinking that we were going to set any sort of standard. But this was something that needed to be done. And it wasn't like we were the best people to do it, but we would do it. And so we, um, we, we wrote a catalog of 23 different uh, techniques. Now, we all had experience um, in object-oriented programming. We all had worked on frameworks, trying to develop reusable code. And so we, when we, we got the rule when we got together was we had proposed patterns. And if we all 
could recognize a pattern. If we asked, oh yeah, I've seen that, I've seen that, then that was a pattern. And if one person would bring up something and the rest of us would scratch our heads and say, well, it sounds plausible, but I've never actually seen that before, well, then it wasn't a pattern, it wasn't on our list. And that was exactly the rules we used for putting stuff in. There was no great theory behind uh, where we came up with the patterns. It was just, have we seen them before? And we all had, now the other three all worked at IBM at one point, but their backgrounds were completely different. And, uh, uh, and so, um, so, so it was just four people, four experienced de uh, developers. Um, actually, we all had PhDs, so we were pretty academic developers. But the other, like I said, the other three all were, were working in industry. Um, Eric has gone on. Uh, he was uh, one of the principal architects behind Eclipse, and he's done all sorts of stuff since then. Um, uh, Richard sort of went off in a odd direction. He's become more of a management consultant in, in Australia and, and, and probably makes huge amounts of money, but doesn't really do computer things too much anymore. And unfortunately, uh, John Vasidis passed away. And so uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of talking about doing a second edition, but uh, the loss of John has, um, you know, one of the reasons that hasn't happened yet. So anyway, the, um, the, the advantage is, you know, see what was a purpose when we did this is we were really trying to make a vocabulary for talking about design at a higher level rather than just talking about classes and methods and interfaces to be able to talk about particular combinations of classes that we were were used to doing and so the the names of the patterns themselves become a vocabulary and that has several purposes one is if you're learning, uh, our claim was this was something that experts were doing, and so if you want to be an expert, probably be a good idea to, to learn them, and so as sort of a set of techniques. But then as experts who are going to be talking, I mean, our opinion was that most experts who read the book would know all the patterns already. They wouldn't learn any new patterns when they read the book. They would instead now have a set of, of words, of names, that they could use to talk to other people. And I noticed that, that the 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 conversation at Uppsala, the big object oriented conference then, changed you know, two or three years after the book because people had read the book and they were using the same, the, the same words. And it was interesting when Java came out uh, because uh, it was the first system that um, you know, got, got popular after the book um, came out and it wasn't that the people who designed it learned the patterns by reading the book. They, they knew the patterns all before, the, but they, they actually chose names. They changed the names of the system to, to fit the book. And so um, it, when I started reading the Java code, it made it easy for me to figure things out because oh, they, 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 they said this is the observer, so I can, oh, that's obviously the observer. It made it a lot easier. Uh, it does help design because when you're trying to think about how to design something, you know, I think part of what we do when we are designing is we remember, we, we run through all these things, we possible ways to do it that we've seen in the past and having a, 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 a sort of a set of examples, a, a, a set of checklist jogs our memory, lets us, we can, well, maybe I could use this, maybe I could use this, and as you run down the list, of course, most of the time, the answer is no, I couldn't, that wouldn't work very well, and you get a couple of them that are plausible, and now you can sort of compare them and, and talk about them with other people as to, should I use this approach or that approach? Having names for the techniques is important. Uh, the, in the book, one of the, so one of the things we got together a few years, uh, it was, it was actually sh about half a year before John passed away. We got together, talked about second edition, and one of the things we agreed on was that the categories of patterns in the book were pretty lame. So there are three categories of patterns in the book. Uh, it's uh, structural, behavioral, and creational. Now the creational patterns are pretty well defined. You can, when you look at the patterns and say, is it creational or not, really obvious. But behavioral and structural, a lot of the patterns, you, you could argue either way. It's, they're not very good divisions. And so we try to come up with a, a better set of divisions, and we decided that a good way would be to talk about the core patterns, because everybody wants to know which are the ones that are most important. And when we wrote the book, we didn't know. We, we couldn't have told you that th these are more important than that, but given many years of people using, we can just sort of certain patterns are pretty rare. People just don't use them all that often. Other patterns are a lot more common, and so those are clearly the core ones, the ones you should learn first. Uh, so we decided that, that uh, 
Now, these uh, composite strategy, decorator, state, iterator, observer, mediator, facade, proxy, command, and template method and adapter were the core patterns. We added value object and null object as, as patterns that we probably should have put in the, in the, um, probably should have put in the book, but, uh, but didn't. And, and you know, I'll see as I go through. So that's one of the things. What patterns were, were missing? Well, you know, there's an infinite number of patterns that are missing in the sense that there's all sorts of stuff that, that programmers do. But we were looking at these fairly small patterns. A lot of the other pattern books uh, have, have much bigger, more complicated patterns, or they're talking about user interface or concurrent programming or, or all sorts of different things, which weren't, wasn't the topic of our book. But thinking about these kind of smaller object-oriented design patterns, what, um, what, what ones are missing? You know, there, there are some that, in retrospect, we missed. So um, the, the composite pattern. So let, let me, I'm just going to just go through a couple of patterns and talk about things we did wrong in the patterns. Um, and I'm sure every single pattern we wrote, we could find something we did wrong, where we didn't quite describe it right, where there's a mistake people could make. And I've, uh, I um, gave a, a talk all on things we did wrong, or you know, fail faults in design patterns. And I had a three-hour lecture, and I only got through half my material. So I, I actually... Uh, have, have a lot more material I could do it on, but we're going to just focus on, uh, on, uh, on, on two patterns and just say a little bit about composites. So composites is a great pattern. I, it's one of my favorite patterns because frequently when I've been designing a system and I figured out how to use a composite pattern in it, it changed the, the whole feel of the system and it made things a lot more composable. Um, it's sort of artificial because the real world doesn't have real composites in it. Composites are about our models of the world. Um, but there's a lot of times when we're building a system where we want to have trees of objects. And we'd like the objects to be sort of consistent and be able to be self-similar and, and treat them the same all the time. So one way you can do that is you can say, well, we'll have a, a component class, and there's all these different subclasses of components, and every component can have children. And, and uh, so you actually will make the superclass say that a component has children which are of type component and has some, some set of them. Now, this is not the, the, the composite pattern. This is like almost the composite pattern, but not quite the composite pattern. What happens when you do this is that you'll discover that there's actually some of these classes down here never have children. They're, if you build a tree, they're the leaves of the tree. And they'll never have children. And as you're programming, though, it would be really easy because of the way you've designed the system. It's easy to give them children, and then weird things happen. And you're trying to figure out what went wrong. So it's, it's not safe to design it this way when, in fact, some of these classes can't have children. So given this, say this is a book, and a book has chapters and sections and subsections and down to some, but say maybe, maybe paragraphs are the smallest. Or maybe you say, well, paragraphs aren't the smallest. I want to model every sentence. Okay, sentences are the smallest. No, I want to model every word. I want to model every character. Fine. Something will be the smallest, and you get down to whatever is the smallest. And what we said because of inheritance is that it has children too, and, and so there will be, be this, this issue. So the, the real composite pattern is to say that we divide the subclasses into two categories. There's leaves and composites. These are sort of categories of subclasses. And composites have the children, not, not the leaf classes. And, and this way, you're prevented from giving a, a, an object that isn't supposed to have a children. You're, you're prevented from having the children. Now, the problem with this is we want them all to have the same interface. So given the fact that they're different now. How can we make them have the same interface? Well, there's certain tricks you can do. Like you can say, I want to iterate over children. And you can say, I want to iterate over the children of a leaf. That's easy. You know, null iterator, no problem. Uh, but what about adding and removing? That's, that's trickier. And you end up always. Every time you do this, you have this problem, which is, should we put the interface for adding and removing only on the composite classes, or should we put them up on the component classes? You could put the interface for adding and removing on the component classes, and then you could implement them in the leaves by having an error message, raising an exception or something. So that's one way you could do it. And the other way you could do it is just put them in here, and then you have to downcast. What you, you've got a component. All you know is it's a component, and I want to add or remove, so I'm going to do a downcast there. 
And the book says, the book says the best solution is to implement the interface here and have, have error messages. That's what the book says, and the world has sort of proved the book wrong. Because if you look at all the libraries people do now, they uh, put it uh, even in C++. Um, so at the time, the small talk people all would put it here. Well, it's hard to say in small talk because you don't actually have uh, static type checking in small talk, so you don't have these well-defined interfaces. But if you sort of looked at the, the, the thought that was going behind them, it was clearly implemented only in the composites and people were treating it this way. But the uh, in C++, it was done the way the book says, except once C++ added safe downcasting, type you know, runtime safe uh, downcasting, then it changed. And so even now the C++ libraries don't do it the way the book says. And the Java libraries, if you look at them, they don't do it the way the book says either. So the book was just wrong. Um, and I mean, it's not a big deal, but if you're, if you're blindly copying the book, you know, you're, you're going to do it wrong because it, it was a mistake there. So observer. Um, um, so the observer pattern is, is a, a very common one using user interfaces. And the, what the book says, uh, and this is actually not quite what the book says because this is from a small talk class, design, uh, object oriented design class I use in small talk. So I put, so put small talk names here instead of C++ names. But um, the, uh, what, what the observer pattern says is you've got two type of classes in this pattern, which are the subjects and the observers. And the observers are going to you know, observe the subjects. And there's this dependency between them. Uh, actually, Smalltalk calls this the uh, uh, dependency mechanism. And uh, you know, in Microsoft calls it publish subscribe. And there's, you know, there's a lot of different names for this pattern. It's a pretty common pattern where the observers are going to come and register on the subjects. And then whenever the subjects change, they notify all the observers. And then the observers have to uh, you know, respond. They do something with it. And the, the observers have to implement an interface. So the observer is really an interface. If you do this in Java, in, uh, the observer will be an interface rather than a class. But subject typically is a class because the subject has to keep a list of all the dependents. Somewhere in there, it may not be the subject keeps it directly, maybe stored off in some other object. But, but the way you think about that is that the subjects keep a list of the observers. And you know, done in all sorts of languages, all of the, it's always... You know, this is the big idea you always see. Now, this is actually pretty funny because when you're going to use this to build something, it's often the case that, um, in the way you think about it, the observe the subjects aren't really supposed to know the observers. And so here's my favorite example, which is you're, mo you're modeling some Chicago mobsters, and you've got uh, the uh, the the FBI that is. Uh, this, we're thinking 1920s gangster era. Uh, they are uh, looking for these guys who are going to be robbing the bank. And so you know, back in those days, they, they might wiretap, but they often would you know, rent a hotel room across the street and look with binoculars. I mean, that was the sort of uh, 1920s uh, technology that was used for a spy. And of course, the mobsters knew the FBI agents might be on their tail, but they didn't, they didn't know if they were. But when you implement this, when you, when you code it up, whenever the mobsters are performing operations like rob bank or drive a getaway car, they have to perform an operation self-changed on themselves. I mean, that's part of how you have to implement this to make it all work. And it's like, it's like in saying that these mobsters, when they're going to go do something bad, they, they walk outside and yell at everybody, I'm going to rob a bank today. Now, now they're, they're never going to do that in reality, but that's the way you have to code it. To, they have to register these. And a, a typical bug is that you forget to register. You're making a change to your state, and, and you don't, you don't uh, call the, the self-change message. And, and, and what always happens when we do self-changed, it iterates over the dependents, the observers and notifies each of the observers and you know, that's always what happens. Um, and the C++, there are a lot of systems that did it just the same way as in Smalltalk. We were pretty happy with this and we figured with a language like Java that's like halfway in between C++ and Smalltalk, it, it'd be done the same way there too. And in fact, the very first version of, of, um, of Java with AWT, they, they did this. They had an observer and a subject classes and it was, it was modeled just after the book. 
And they very quickly learned that didn't work. And so uh, very quickly they came up with, abs- with listeners, which is what you know, all Java people all know about listeners. You probably don't even know that there's a textbook version of Observer hidden in there that nobody uses anymore. <coughs> but the, 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 what happens is that uh, update always has an argument, which is this, an event. And there's not a single interface the book says, you know, you've got a single observer interface. And in small talk, there really was a single observer interface because they don't really do interface checking. So it really wasn't because, you know, sometimes you'd pass a really complicated argument as your, uh, as your argument. And sometimes it's a very simple one. And, and because it wasn't any uh, static type checking, it didn't matter. But um, the, so there's a lot of different kind of event listeners and event listener interface can have more than one update message. And just as an example of what I mean by that, you look at a swing, and swing has you know, a number of different type of listeners in there. So like component listener actually has four different type of, of operations to not- notif- different notifications. Um, and then there's all these different kind of events. So there's a whole event hierarchy. So if you're going to make a whole new type of listener, you can make a new event. So you know, there's something that was missed. We didn't talk, there's no really no hints. I've read through carefully. Did we even hint that this was a good thing to do? No, we didn't hint this was a good thing to do. It'd be nice to say, oh yeah, we, we thought of that in advance. And it's even worse than that because there's a, a part of the book, so this is a quote from the book, talking about uh, this kind of thing. It's talking about uh, push versus pull model. So the, the, a push model is that when an event occurs, the the, and you notify, that notification message has all the information that you're going to need versus a poll where once you get an update, you have to go back to the subject and ask it for more information because the update message didn't have everything you needed. So a poll is going to require, yeah, a poll is going to require two messages, you know, one to notify, and then it's going to have to come back and get it the second time, whereas a push, you just get you just get the one. So push is more efficient in some things than pull. But what we said was, eh, that may be true, but there's problems with push because, um, so it says there's, there's push and pull, two different things. Uh, the amount of information may vary widely, that's true. The pull model emphasizes the subject's ignorance of its observers. So when you say the pull model, then the subject doesn't know anything about the observers, so it just says, I changed, and that because it doesn't know what the observers need, and the observers all know what they need, and so different observers can ask for different things because they're going to need different amounts. So that's what it's saying. Whereas the push model assumes objects know something about their observers' needs. Yeah, that's true. The push model might make observers less reusable because subject classes make assumptions about observer classes that might not always be true. And that's completely false because the best way to get reusability is to use the push model. And, but to do that, you have to have all these different interfaces. What you do is you break up your type of listeners into, you, know, you have all these different subtypes of listener, and each type is for a very specific kind of event. And you can, like if you're gonna follow a mouse, if you know this is just for following a mouse, I mean, what can a mouse do? What well, can move and a button can move? And that's it. Now, so you could easily enumerate all the different types of state. And if you, if you know if it's a keyboard press, then what you know is going to be what key press, but you can put that in the event object. You can make event objects that completely encapsulate the kind of change. And so, in fact, the, the push model, once you have a lot of different interfaces, different listener interfaces, the push model actually gives you great reusability. So, the, again, the book was, was wrong right there. Uh, and there's this, this, this uh, technique, I guess. It's often called data binding. I'm not sure every time people say data binding, they mean this, but um, I've uh, been using uh, Vaden, and Vaden calls it data binding, and uh, some other systems call it data binding too. So the idea there is you've got, you're going to implement your subject, your model, as a, as a collection of objects, each of which matches a certain, so one of them represents a list, one of them represents a text field, one of them represents, you know, whatever, and, and, then, you, and you have different uh, observers for, for those. And so when you make a object out of a group of these, you then are going to, you know, change your text field not by assigning a string to a variable, but by telling this text holder, you know, here's a new piece of text. 
So you set, you set a value of a property and then it automatically updates and so you've got some object that's looking at, is observing, listening, whatever to it and, and it will change. So you end up now with reusable observers. And there's another advantage that you don't have to uh, write these update messages. You don't have to explicitly invoke a change message. It sort of things automatically change. And it's just a lot more pluggable. It's, 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 it's nice. It's, it's an improvement. Now, the thing is, there were some small talk systems that did this back in 1990. So I had seen some systems that did this, but I hadn't recognized that as a general pattern. And partly because I guess we hadn't seen C++ systems that did that, so so you know we didn't have this give and take of uh, going back and forth. So when I when I learned this, and it was actually I, a year or two ago, I was talking with Eric, and he you know he said, well, this is a pattern. I was going to question, what did we miss in Observer? And there's clearly the thing about um, about uh, listeners that we missed. And he said, well, there's there's data binding. I said, data binding? I mean, I, data binding is in Vaden. How's that? And then we went back and forth, and it, and it took like half an hour, and then suddenly I realized, yeah, 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 we, we missed it. That was something we should we should have had. Again, having the vocabulary means we can communicate pretty quickly about these things, and that's uh, that's an advantage. I'm talking fast enough that I'm losing my breath, <laughs> but uh, I I timed this, and I it was it's hard to get it all in on the time, so I'm trying to go fast. Okay, um, so uh, so that's what I'm going to say about uh, about observer. Um, we there were a couple other patterns. A value object. I was just in the Java nine tutorial, and Java nine is going to make value objects part of the programming language. I said, well, that's interesting because uh, this is you know an issue of when something becomes part of the programming language then it's not really the pattern anymore the pattern is you know, have to do things a certain way to make it uh, to, to support it and and value objects are uh, important design idea in object oriented programming object oriented programming is very much about state and value objects are about not having not worrying about state you, you want to have your values be immutable be these stateless things you don't care about object identity you only care about equality uh, and my experience is when you I build big systems, there's going to be certain layer that's that's stateless like that. That, is, that it's just all based on values, and you sort of have an algebra of of combining the values. Now it may only be 10% of the whole system, or 20 or 30%. It's it's rarely 90%, but still that's a sort of a significant part of of um, and, uh, and I mentioned domain-driven design because Eric Evans. A lot of people have actually tried to design to describe value object as a pattern and have not succeeded. I, I failed years ago and Kent Beck failed years ago and I don't know how many other people failed. Those are those are ones that I know tried to do it, but Eric wrote a really good version of it. So um, anyway, we, we, we thought that should be, but now that I realize it's going to be in Java 9, I'm second, I'm, I'm wondering, well, should we really put in the book if it's, you know, it's going to be a standard there, part of the language. And the other is null object. Now this one has actually been written about by many people. Um, it was one of those things when we saw it at the patterns conferences. It was like, how did we miss that? That's such an obvious pattern. We all knew it. We all did it. But it just never occurred to us to put that in. And partly it's, it's very simple. A null object says if you're writing code where you're checking for null all the time, that probably means that there's some important concept, this idea that you don't have a thing, or it's an error thing, or something like that. That's probably what's going on, and you should model it directly. You shouldn't just be passing null around, and, and then you have to write this, this code. So whatever your interface is that you're, you're checking, you then say, well, we've got an option, which is a empty such and so, or a null sump such and so, or, or you, you add that to your class hierarchy, and then you don't ever have to pass null, and instead of writing this kind of code, you just write that kind of code. Um, so that's, that's all null o object is, it's pretty simple. It goes in with the other design patterns, so uh, when we have, yeah, something wrong with that picture, but uh, when you have a, a abstract class part and then you've got composites, as a s some subclasses are composites and some are decorators, uh, you also have a null part. It's just sort of a natural, fits in with, with the other design patterns of a, of a particular. So 
We decided not to actually have a, a section on this, but it is a fact that some patterns get abused a lot. And I think instead of saying it's a separate category, and people often say, like media or singleton, people say, oh, that's a really horrible pattern. Uh, I actually think the problem is more that we didn't describe it very well, because every pattern has, has trade-offs. They've got pluses and minuses, and there's this tendency when you're writing to try to emphasize the good things of the pattern, how wonderful this pattern is. And there's always negative consequences. Uh, and it's important to think about the negative consequences and describe it. So with Singleton, uh, just as an example, because if you Google Singleton, you will find a lot of people telling you how awful it is. And they're mostly right. What they're saying is are true statements. But you know, Singleton is supposed to be used to encapsulate and control global state when when you know it's forced upon you it's not a way of of blessing global state and then and then telling everybody it's really okay because after all it's a design pattern so it must be good now that's not the purpose of it at all and uh you really should when if you have global state your first reaction should try to be to get rid of it and it's only when you can't get rid of it when it's a necessary part uh then then singleton can be a uh, a reasonable solution um, and mediator, well, I'm, um, so, so mediator, the purpose of mediator is that you have a bunch of other classes that you'd like to make reusable. You think they ought to be reusable, but what you see is every time you build a new you know, application or a new use case, you end up subclassing these things because there's a bunch of objects that interact with each other in some way, and that, that kind of interaction will change from one use to another use. And so instead of doing that, we're going to pull out their interaction. We're going to make their interaction be a separate object, and then when you go from one case to another, you're going to redo, you know, just throw out the old mediator and write a whole new mediator. Mediators tend to be ugly. They tend to be not object-oriented. Uh, they're not code you're proud of. It's like they're like adapters. Adapters are usually not code you're proud of either, but they let you do something. They let you, the other classes. So people often say, well, here's our system. We've got these mediators. Well, if those are mediators, where are the colleague classes that are made reusable because of your mediators? And if you don't have any, then they're not mediators. It's just ugly code that you're trying to bless by saying it's a mediator. So... Uh, so these are the, the creational patterns, which, like I said, is actually a good category. When you look at them, they're clearly about creating objects, except for singleton, which is about not creating objects. But, I mean, it's still about creation. Um, we didn't, so uh, if, if we're going to you know, ever get a second edition out, we should include dependency injection. This is a, uh, um, the name came about after the book came out. And the concept hadn't ever been verbalized. Now, I can see stuff in, in small talk code where I say, well, this is actually dependency injection. Dependency injection in, in um, dynamic languages is a lot simpler than it is in, in static languages. Uh, so, uh, you know, in some sense you can say the idea's been around longer, but yeah, I'm not sure. It's just because code that matches the idea has been around longer doesn't mean the idea's been around longer because people were doing it subconsciously. They weren't consciously doing that. And so, um, anyway, it's changing. So a lot of these other patterns don't get used as much in Java as they did in C++ because people have, have these dependency mechanism uh, s um, frameworks that they use instead. And that especially is true of singleton. And a lot of uses of singleton. You can get rid of singleton by using dependency injection instead. So if we had the core, then what are, uh, what are the peripheral? What are the not the core? And so memento, chain of responsibility, bridge, visitor are the ones that we say, yeah, they're, they're real patterns, but they don't really get used that much. Uh, maybe your application, they do get used a lot. So that's just sort of our, our feeling as they don't. Um, type object is one that I like a lot, but we, we've got it labeled under a peripheral as a, as a pattern not in the book. Uh, extension object is a favorite of Eric's. Um, and, and John wrote this generation gap, which is only it's about code generation. So if you are uh, trying to automatically generate object-oriented code, which not too many people do, then, you know, then it's an interesting pattern. And John's not around to defend it. We'll, if we get a second edition, we'll definitely put it in, though. Um, 
Then we also thought the idea of, of compound patterns, patterns that are really made by composing other patterns. We didn't want to talk about this in design patterns. Uh, one of the things, um, when we were doing the book, we, um, you know, there's, there's the issue of, of abstract class. Is abstract class a, a language feature or is it a, is it a, a pattern? And in both Smalltalk and C++, it's a pattern. It's not a language. So if you are a C++ fan, you can argue with me, but I'll, I will prove you wrong. Uh, in Java, it gets clearly, of course, a, a language feature. So I think we were smart, I mean, without even knowing Java hadn't even really come out yet, but it was, it was good not to include. But the reason we didn't include it was, if we had, if we had said abstract class was a pattern, then for half of all the patterns in the book, we would have to say that this pattern includes the abstract class pattern. And you have to talk about how this pattern can be composed of other patterns. We didn't want to talk about that in the book. We were really trying to make it simple. Just talk about patterns, don't talk uh, meta patterns. Don't say how patterns can be composed and so on. Just just focus on the the code itself. Um, but you know that was that was a long ago, and now you know, people are more sophisticated, so it's it's not a problem. And, and the fact is that uh, I've seen a lot of it with flyweight. The problem is that it's actually a very rare pattern. You have to combine a lot of different things for a particular purpose, and people uh, often do half of it, and then they'll call it. Uh, flyweight because it's more like flyweight than it is like anything else. And if we had broken this down into, into smaller pieces, um, and, and sort of the same with the interpreter pattern. Okay, so I want to finish with uh, a couple things that if we, again, I, these are criticisms of the book. Um, one of them is that the book actually has a little bit on refactoring, but not very much. Um, I uh, Bill Updike and I wrote the first paper that used the word refactoring in it. And w uh, my group built the first automated refactoring tool, which we actually had the tool out about the time that um, design patterns came out. It was, it was for Smalltalk, the Smalltalk refactoring browser. So and I'm clearly a major fan of refactoring. Uh, but when we wrote the book, we were, in fact, everybody else is too. Everyone else in the book was a, a fan of refactoring. But when we wrote the book, we didn't want to talk about the fact that you'd probably be better off not putting patterns in your program from the beginning, but you sort of wait until it gets complicated enough. Wait till you really need it, and then refactor your program to put the patterns, and that's really a better way to think about it. And if you, if you start from the beginning of what are all the patterns that might be in the program, and you put all those patterns in from the beginning, probably it's going to be way too complicated. Because you can imagine all sorts of stuff, and only half of it's really going to come to pass. So, so sort of be conservative, put the patterns in lazily, um, and you'll, you'll be better off that way. Okay, so we didn't say that. We, we believed it, but we didn't say it because a lot of people back then, this was a long time ago, so a lot of people back then were you know, fans of, of big upfront design, and you know, we wanted people to think about the patterns and not start arguing about what we considered less important issues. The book really had one theme, and we didn't want to distract. Again, it'd be very different now. It'd be very different now. Um, Something that we didn't ever occurred to us that people would do this is people will will try to evaluate how good a program is by how many patterns are in it. Um, I'm sure you've seen this, right? Well, it's just crazy. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. But but people do it all the time, and 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 so you know, patterns aren't a measure of goodness because each pattern has places it works and places it don't doesn't work. And it's the question is how well does it fit the program? That's what's important is how well does it is the overall design. And and um, so anyway, that's that's something that needs to be clear. And it's not clear in the book at all. We didn't. It never occurred to us that people would do that. Um, there's a lot of different uses of patterns of managing variability. Um, this is Joe Yoder's talk last hour um, about decoupling so that when you make a change to one part of the system, it will have less of an effect on the other. And, um, and I guess a dependence management is a similar thing. Um, anyway, being able to, this is, these are things that Heads First Design Patterns talks about well. And each, when, and when they go through the patterns, they talk about the design principles that are exhibited in a pattern. The patterns, in some sense, are examples of these design principles. And, and that's a, a great way to look at them. And I you know, 
did that a lot in my teaching of design patterns as well. I was trying to use them as, there, there are more concrete examples of it. Des design principles are often hard for beginners to understand. They can, they can copy a pattern. That's sort of easier for them. Knowing exactly when to use it and what the purpose is, that's a little bit harder. Um, so it's a good thing to talk about. And in general, you know, again, patterns are a way of helping you come up with a good design. They're not, they're not the end. It's not the purpose of how many you can be. And then there's a, a great quote from Christopher Alexander, who was a, a, a building architect who wrote about patterns of making buildings. And he said that um, you know, uh, patterns are not the way, they're a gate. And you're supposed to go through the gate and enter into the timeless way of building. And what he was meaning was that you know, the patterns are what you use to sort of learn and you practice. And then once you get good, you can sort of do what the patterns are trying to make you do automatically. You've learned that. And, and following the pattern slavishly is pointless. That's not the purpose of them anyway. So I guess there's something I said before. The patterns are examples of principles. And it would be good to focus on that. Uh, and patterns are part of an overall design style. And, and this is something that probably we're not going to be able to do in the second edition, because after 20 years, I still haven't figured it out. Uh, but that is, um, that is that you know, different people use different sets of patterns because they've got different styles. And, and the patterns are, in some sense, representations of their style. Uh, the, there's a, a book, or a paper rather, called Evolving Frameworks that Don Roberts and I wrote a long time ago that looked at how when you're working on an object-oriented framework and, and you're refactoring it, how the patterns come in and they sort of come in in the middle of, of this process. So there's one particular case where, where the patterns make sense uh, and where you can sort of describe how they get used. But there's a lot of other ways people use and they're going to have different type of patterns um, because of that. So. Something that it'd be good if the book could talk about, but I'm not uh, sure we will. Okay, so there's a lot of, of criticism, and I said I can go on for hours with individual patterns with things we did wrong with them, but nevertheless, you know, we could have done better, but we did pretty good. And uh, I know that that's, that's uh, obvious given the impact they've had. Um, again, I'll point to hillside.net as a great place to go for more information. And this is my email address. Um, I'm going to be around all day tomorrow. If anybody wants to talk to me, uh, send me email tonight. Uh, I've got an appointment with somebody at 9.30, which probably won't take more than half an hour. Otherwise, I can be happy to talk with you just about any time. So I guess I, I tried to cram it down, but um, it's 7.02. So I didn't didn't quite do it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? It's an advantage of being at the end of the day. If if you guys don't want to leave, I don't have to leave either for a while. <laughs> we have been talking about writing the second edition of Design Patterns for well over ten years. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the reason. No, that's, that's not the reason. I, I've actually started working on, on d d doing various pieces. Um, you know, John passed away, and Richard is you know, doing something entirely different. Uh, uh, Eric has said, yeah, if, I, you know, if, if there's something, he, he'll, he, he's willing to jump in and, and work on it some more. So um, my, you know, what I need to do is get enough so for of a kernel of new things to do. And, that, and I give these talks that criticize design patterns partly as a way to, um, to uh, partly as a way of, of gathering up this information. So I've got lots of ideas now. Um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm still, I keep telling my wife, yes, I'm going to do it. She says, well, why haven't you done more work on it? So, uh, it, it yeah. Which pattern of abuse? Which pattern, um, which pattern of abuse has haunted you personally the most? Haunted. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't. Uh, from from the systems I've worked on, I can't say that any of them are. Because, I mean, I don't feel 
passionate, I don't, I don't feel personal about any of them. You know, I try stuff out and you work with it for a while and if it doesn't work, then I switch to something else and, and for all of them I can think, well not all, but because like some like Memento I don't really use that, and Bridge is another one that doesn't seem for me to get used much. Um, but, but say like Visitor is something that, that you see abused a lot and it's because it's cool. Now the first time you look at it you say, whoa, that's interesting and and they say i wonder if i could use that and I, i've never i've never had a visitor oh I, I i could use a visitor here and then so you put it in and then you know six months later you're shaking your head and saying oh that was dumb i shouldn't have you but how, how else are you going to learn and they're so rare that they're not very common so you know this is the sort of thing it's likely to happen but th this is true of like any technology how do you learn when it should not be used well you learn when it should not be used by using it when you shouldn't use it i mean it, how else are we going to learn these things so uh the partly because it's rare and then it's cool it's cool and rare and those are the two things now it, one place it, use, it gets used a lot is if you're do, dealing with programming languages. It, programming languages are uh, compilers and refactoring tools, and my group does lots and lots of stuff. For re so refactoring tools always have the visitor pattern in them, and it works really well for that because your programming language doesn't change very much. Now, we built this refactoring tool for Fortran. So we've got Fortran 90, uh, uh, you know, we have Fortran 77, Fortran 90, Fortran 2003, Fortran 2008. Okay, so we actually have to deal with a problem of, yeah, your language has sort of changed and they're not 100% they're not backward compatible and how do you make your, your, your uh, but, but still, typically programming languages are pretty stable and so, uh, so it, it works well. Um, and and you know, there are other cases where it works well, but a lot of people will go their whole career and never see a case where a visitor should be used. And, and they feel bad because it's a cool pattern. <laughs> Uh, one more question. If you were to actually, uh, if you were asked to teach somebody patterns or refactoring to, refactoring to patterns, how would you go about it? So I, I, I have been teaching patterns a lot because I have an object engineering design course. I taught the software engineering course at the university and always ha had a section on, on patterns there. So especially when I'm doing uh, not so much the software engineering course because we just had a couple weeks on it, but the other course, one of the things I like to do is you know, give homeworks and tell people, you, here's a little example, use this pattern. Here's a little example, use this pattern. And I pick cases where the pattern is plausible, but in fact not a good idea. And people learn that you can refactor. If you said, make this refactoring, you can do it. You know, that's the thing about refactoring is that it's sort of value neutral. Now, Actually, uh, Martin Fowler says that refactoring is about improving a design. But if you're doing a name change, how do you know if you're really, you don't know if it's improving the design or not. And the tools, the refactoring tools, they don't know if you're improving the design. And typically, you can, you can like do um, uh, extract a method or you can do inlining a method. Most refactorings, there's an inverse and they're both, they're both refactorings. How do you know which one is actually, for this program, is improving your design? Well, you know, it's obviously some exterior uh, uh, I, uh, concepts. And it's the same way with patterns. You can, you can see how you could turn this into a strategy, but is that a good idea? Well, you don't know until you try. Uh, maybe by try it might be on the blackboard or you just have a discussion with people. You have to think about it. What's, what's the result of the, on the design going to be after we have the the, the pattern. So anyway, I think an important thing is to show people that applying patterns can make their programs worse. Uh, and then, then, they, then they understand patterns better when they see that. Any more? Thank you very much.